Um, I want to teach out of uh, 2 Samuel 11 and 12. This is where Bill Schlegel and I are right now. And uh, there's just some fabulous insights that I've received and some just some wonderful encouragement. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a weird chap after the prayers and the understanding of the number of people that are hurting, you know, for Samuel or Second Samuel 11 and 12 about David and Bathsheba and Nathan can be a difficult chapter because, you know, David has been on such a pinnacle. I mean, he's just, he's done every, basically, he hasn't done everything right, but he's done most things right, and he's really loved the Lord, and he's really showed up for God, and he's a good example of how sometimes getting to the top is a lot easier than being on the top, and we see that with David. So let's get into this chapter now. When we, when I do an expository teaching like this, you know, God sprinkles lessons through his word, kind of like sprinkling salt on the page. It just kind of lands everywhere. So um, unlike a topical teaching where you're going to pick one lesson and teach on it, an expository teaching like this, there's just a lot of different lessons coming at us. And because of that, uh, it helps to have a notebook. When you're reading the word like this, it helps to have something that you can go back, you know, you can scribble things kind of as they go by, and then you can go back and kind of close your eyes and say, now, what did I learn? And you can go and review the lessons. And that's certainly worth doing in a segment like this. So we start out in 2 Samuel chapter 11, and it says, and it came to pass in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle and they go out to battle in the spring because you get when you get through the, the spring harvests and then you really have a break, a little bit of a break before the summer harvests or else the summer harvests of vegetables uh, aren't, is not as, as labor intensive as the, as the harvest of the grain and the, which then has to be beaten out and, and, and that kind of thing. So the, the kings are going to battle in the spring and David sends Joab and his servants with him, meaning his army. So David, King David sends Joab, his general, and his army, and all Israel, a lot of men from different points in Israel. And they laid waste the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. Now, if you go back a chapter to 2 Samuel chapter 10, um, the king of Ammon died, and David sent a delegation to Ammon to you know, express his sorrow and that kind of thing. And his delegation was completely mistreated. And so there was a war, as you read 2 Samuel chapter 10, between the Ammonites and David. And here in 2 Samuel chapter 11, then you have the continuation of this war. And it says they're besieging Rabbah, but David stayed at Jerusalem. Um, and one of the reasons he stayed was the length of the war. And we'll see that coming up here in another couple of verses. Let me bring up a map. I'll just share my screen. Let's make sure we know where we are in, uh, in the scope of things. So you should now be looking at a, a map of Israel. And here's Jerusalem where David was. And then you drop down uh, 2,500 feet or so into the Jordan Valley. Here's the Jordan River about 20 miles away. And then you're going to go probably 30, 35 miles to Rabbah. So you've got maybe 50, 55 miles from Jerusalem to Rabbah, which a good armed force, they're going to be able to walk that in two days. So here's Rabbah, and this is where the army of David was, and this is Jerusalem. And it's, um, it's important to kind of have that in the back of your mind, because when people like Uriah are going back and forth and the messenger is going back and forth between the battle in Jerusalem. You know, this isn't just like a two hour hike. I mean, this is, this is days that things, that things happen over things in the ancient world happen much more slowly than they do today with, you know, the speed of the internet. So David's staying at Jerusalem, verse two, one evening, David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the King's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. Now, the record is not going to impugn Bathsheba. Um, and yet, it's, um, we need to be, a, be able to understand that in the ancient world, you knew who, where people were and who could see you from where. Uh, let me bring up a, another illustration here. 
and share my screen again, if I can get it to behave. Yeah, um, I can. Uh, so let me do this. There we go. And share my screen. Where did it get that? There it goes. Screen share. And wow, that's interesting. Well, you'll have to let me know if you can see this. Can you see that? Yes. yes. Okay, good. That's interesting. It kind of is different. Um, so this is a, a drawing of what the Jerusalem at the time of David looked like after he had had time to build his palace. And you see David's palace, the Jebusite city down here had been very, very tightly packed. And then it looks for all the world like David put this uh, rock revetment in place to support his castle, and we see remnants of this. You can still see this rock wall today when you go to Israel, and it's still supporting what looks to be the edge of a huge palace structure. So this would have been David's palace. We don't know exactly the shape it would have took. This is certainly a viable one, but you see the roof of the house and, or the palace, and you can see that from the roof of the palace, then he David could pretty much see all of what was going on in Jerusalem and anybody down here in Jerusalem could tell whether they saw could say, see people on top of the roof because obviously up on top of the palace you're going to get guards uh, on nice days you're going to get David and his wives and various and sundry other things so people up here could see Jerusalem and people down here could see the people on the top of the palace and by the way, when David moved the ark into Jerusalem, again, this area down here in the Jebusite city, the old Jebusite city was very tightly packed. And so David would have gone north and expanded and then set up some kind of tent area. It might have been here. It might have been over here. It might have been back in here. We don't have any archaeological remains from a tent. Um, but, we, but the best guess is that David moved up the hill up north, this is the direction of north, and would have put the Ark of God in here in this tent that he set up. Later on, if you studied the, the, the city at the time of Solomon, Solomon blew these walls out and went up. Up here was the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite, and this is where God wanted the temple built. So in the time of Solomon, if you see a, a city of the time of Solomon, these walls go up. Solomon's palace is then here, much greater than David's palace, and then the temple is up here. And so that's how Jerusalem is looking. And so David is here on the top of his palace. He's looking down at Jerusalem, and he sees a woman bathing. And that's what we see um, here in verse 2. And, you know, this is one of those things where if he could see her, she could see him. Again, the text does not impugn Bathsheba. On the other hand, Bathsheba knew what was going on and certainly was to a degree complicit in what happened. Then she was beautiful. Verse three, so David sent and inquired about the woman. By the way, I want to point out um, in these two chapters, 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 2 Samuel chapter 12, two common ordinary words kind of jump out and occur again and again and it's through the, um, through the multiple occurrences of this word that it catches your attention. And then you begin to study them and see what's going on here. And one of them is sent, David sent. And as you, as you read these two chapters, if you pay attention to the word sent, it occurs over and over again. And the, um, the other one is lie or lay. And you'll see that word. And so though both those words go back and forth and through the sending, you see the manipulation of what's going on behind the scenes. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Uh, the, the prefix bat, B-A-T in Hebrew, uh, means daughter. Sheba means oath. So we don't really know if, if the mother and father swore an oath or something, but it's daughter of an oath is what Bathsheba means, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And when David found that out, he should have said, okay, she's married, hands off. And one of the things we see here in chapter 11 is how vigilant we as Christians have to be 
And like in Hebrews 10 and where it says, you know, we provoke one another to love and good works. You know, it really is incumbent upon us to help each other. You know, Galatians that, you know, if someone's overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, you know, come in and support that one in a spirit of meekness, restore that one in a spirit of meekness. And that's what should have happened here. You know, David sent and inquired, as soon as somebody says, this is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eli, uh, Eliam, the wife of Uriah, David should have just said, okay, she's married, hands off. He knew the Ten Commandments. And he had been a fairly holy man. And this is uh, something else here is that um, one of the great victories we see, of course, we know about the great downfall. But one of the great victories here is that David, who was a mighty man of God, got back up. He confessed his sin. He got back up and he moved forward. And we're the only players that God has. The unbelievers aren't playing for God down here. You know, we're the only players God has and we're human and we make mistakes and we have faults and we have failures. And sometimes those mistakes are pretty big. And if we will learn to just be as honest as David and confess our sin and then pick ourselves up and get back up on the horse, so to speak, get back into the game and play our part for God. That's what God really needs for us to be and do down here. So David hears that she's married. Um, doesn't matter to him. I don't know why it didn't matter to him. He had at least six other wives at this point. The Bible doesn't expound that. But verse four, then David sent, and here we see the word sent again, and he sends messengers and took her. And this is one of the reasons, you know, that the Bible says that David did this secretly, but it wasn't that secret because there were a number of people that knew what was going on. I mean, certainly these messengers did, and of course they would talk and word would get around. David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, which she didn't have to do. I know, you know, that, yeah, you're supposed to obey the king, but not when the king's sinning. Uh, she didn't have to do that. So there's, uh, I, I don't know all the pressures that she was under. Uh, the Bible, like I say, it doesn't excuse her, but it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, come out and say that any of this is, you know, her doing. It doesn't specifically state that she's complicit. And that's important because one of the things we're looking at here is, you know, I don't want to pass off responsibility for my sin. You know, if, if I do something wrong and I pass off responsibility for it, what I do is I disempower myself. I just become a victim and I'm not a victim and you're not a victim in your life. You know, and this, this isn't about making David some kind of victim. David is responsible for what he did. And that's clearly in the text. And so she came to him and he lay with her. And then the Bible gives us a very interesting biological piece of information. It says, now she had just purified herself from her uncleanness. And if you go back and you read Leviticus chapter 15, when a woman had a period, when her period was over, she was unclean for seven days. So you've got the period which lasts a few days, or, you know, you women know all about that and I don't but you have the period that lasts a while, and then you have seven days after the period. And by that time, especially when you consider that a sperm can live a while um, inside the female body, then you know, you're, you're having sex with a woman at a time when she's really fertile, and that happened here. So Bathsheba had just purified herself from the, her uncleanness, which was seven days after her period ended, and she returned to her house. Verse five, and the woman conceived and she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Now, different women are, are sensitive to their bodies in different ways. I don't know, and, and the Bible doesn't tell us how soon after Bathsheba conceived, she knew she was pregnant. Was it two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks? The Bible doesn't say this is a topic where you women would have much more insight than I do. Uh, but it, one thing it does say is that if you start in verse one and David, David's army is in the field and now you're down here in verse five, let's say this is a month, five weeks after, six weeks later, 
that the army of Israel has been camped in the open field now, let's say for five weeks. That's a long time. Remember, this is a summertime. You know, this isn't the winter in Israel or the spring or the fall where, you know, it's nice and temperate. You know, we've now gotten into the, into the dead of summer and it is hot and the army of Israel is fighting every day and they're in the field and they're dusty and they're dirty and they're tired and I'm sure they're hungry and they probably don't have the best of food. And, and meanwhile, here's David and he's back in his palace. But we have to, we have to understand the time frame that we're dealing with here. So she sends and tells David, I'm with child. Verse six, so David sent to Joab. He's the you know, top general. Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah had come to him, there, and by the way, there's our send again. So David sent, send me. So Joab sent Uriah to David. Uh, the word send, send, pointing us to shenanigans behind the scenes. Verse 7, when Uriah had come to him, David asked him about how Joab was doing, how the people were doing, how the war was going. The Bible doesn't say Uriah was suspicious, but he should have been. <laughs> I mean, it's like, really, David? Really? There's a lot of different ways you could have found this out without taking uh, a good soldier off the front line. Um, but in any case, David here is, at this point, you know, David is less than the man we would want him, want him to be. He's, he's not admitting his sin. He's not being honest. He's trying to cover his sin. Um, and so then verse 8, then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet, which of course means relax and, and do the things that you would be expected to do. Be with your wife. Verse 8, Uriah departed out of the king's house and a portion of food from the king was sent out after him. But Uriah lay, here's our, again, tracking two words, sent and lay. Uriah lay at the entrance to the king's house. David had lain with Uriah's wife. Uriah had a chance to go home and have sex with his wife, and he didn't. Uriah lay at the entrance of the king's house. Now, the entrance of the king's house being a fortified palace would have uh, gates and, and that kind of thing where the guards would stay. And so Uriah probably at this point, you know, he didn't just lie down in the dirt in front of the door of the palace. He would, he would have gone into a guard chamber and that kind of thing and stayed with what was left of the army back in Jerusalem. So um, Uriah lay at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord. See other, other people in the army and servants and did not go down to his house. And this is um, a great example of how you got two people here, David and Uriah. David gets tempted and gives in and sleeps with another man's wife. I'm sure Uriah was in some way tempted. I mean, he'd been hot, he'd been tired, he'd been dirty for weeks. And now he's got a chance to go home, clean up, have sex with his wife, have a good meal. The king sent probably the best of food, you know, and, and something inside Uriah says, I'm not doing it. And, you know, whatever that thing is, it's got to live in me and it's got to live in you. We have to know what's right, because I'll tell you, there's a lot of temptation and it's going to increase. I just read an article today about how China is ramping up the pressure on Christians you know, there was a, a lady that was questioned in China. She has a, a, a friend or relative overseas. She wrote the lady, her friend, some scripture and put it in the mail. And she was called in for questioning for distributing Christian literature. It's gotten that bad. If you don't think it can happen here, you're not paying attention to what's going on. We've got to pray. We've got to knuckle down, buckle down. We've got to speak up and we've got to speak the word. And we've got to pray that some of these judges and some of these people in authority become Christian and get some godly boldness, put the fear of the Lord in them. Like Matthew 10, 28, we've got to be more afraid of God and the consequences of disobedience than we are of, of you know, wimping out on God and obeying man. I think of, I think of Jay Carty who wrote, um, let's see what it, he wrote, um, taking back ground lost to sin. Uh, he was a professional basketball player, became a pastor uh, over Yes Ministries. 
He wrote a book called Taking Back Counterattack, Taking Back Ground Lost to Sin. And he talked about as he was traveling on the road as a traveling minister and how many times he was tempted. And he said, he said, frankly, sometimes I would give it, I would have given in to the sin, but I was afraid of the consequences. Hey, if that's what it takes so that we don't sin, fine. You know, our job is to make sure that we walk before God. And I love what Uriah did here. He didn't go down to his house. He lay at the entrance of the king's house, verse 10. And when they told David, saying, Uriah didn't go down to his house. You know, David said to Uriah, have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And look at Uriah's answer. So pure hearted, so powerful. Then Uriah said to David, the ark Israel and Judah are staying in booths. And the translation booths is correct. That's the correct Hebrew, not tents. Because the, the typical Bedouin had tents and that kind of thing. There's no real indication that the army of Israel traveled with tents like modern armies do. Um, and particularly in the summertime, remember in the Mediterranean climate in the Middle East, it didn't rain in the summer. So these guys were not afraid of being rained on. They could be bothered by the sun. And so they would, they would find sticks and leaves and stuff and, and set up temporary things they could get under to get out of the shade, very much like or to get into the shade, very much like Jonah did. Um, and so verse 11, I love this. Uriah said to David, the ark Israel and Judah are staying in booths. And when I read the ark there, I'm like, really? David sent the ark along with his army across the Jordan River into Jordan, I mean, into Ammon. To, to, you know, the, the last time that happened when was uh, Eli and Hophni and Phinehas sent the ark into the Philistine territory to help win a war and it got captured. Um, don't have an explanation for this. Don't think it's the wisest move. David may have felt it would encourage the warriors. I'm not really sure. The, the, it's, it's simply not explained. It's stated, but it's not explained. But the ark in Israel and Judah, they're staying in booths and my Lord Joab, and I love that because Joab, I'll tell you, Job may, Joab may have been a, a kind of an impetuous, not, an, a, not a perfect human being, but he was a sterling leader and a, a, a sterling example of a man who led into the fight. He was not the guy that stood on the back lines and then and sent other people to their death in battle. You know, Joab was in the fight and people knew it and he got the respect of his, of his army. And so you see that here where Uriah, who's one of David's mighty men says, my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in the open field. How then can I go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife as you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. What a beautiful heart in this man. And David said to Uriah, stay here today also and tomorrow I will send you off. And there's our word send again. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next day. And when David had called him, he ate and drank, drank in his presence. David made him drunk, just kept handing him stuff to drink. He got drunk, but Uriah still went out in the evening to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but did not go down to his house. And here David now is at a crossroads because at this point, David could have called Uriah and said, okay, I tried to cover up a sin here, but it's obviously not working because of the quality of man that you are, not because of the quality of man that I am. And, and so now let me tell you what happened. And, and it would have been a big embarrassment and there would have been a big problem. And I don't know what the fallout would have been, but I know that a good man wouldn't have died. And instead here we see David again, he's at a crossroads, he takes the wrong road. It, it happens to all of us. The good news is that on the other side of it, David is going to confess his sin and come back. And that's the kind of people we wanna be. We're going to make mistakes, we're gonna make errors. We wanna come back strong when we do. But David wrote in a letter saying, put your eye in the front of the fiercest battle and basically pull back from him and then he'll die in verse 16, that happens. Um, and then verse 18, Joab sent, here's our word sent again, told David about the things of the battle and he commanded the messengers you know, to, to speak about this. Um, 
verse 22, the messenger went, came and told David all that Joab had sent him to say. Um, verse 23, the messenger said to David, the men gained an advantage over us. They came out against us in the field. That's pretty interesting. Here's David's army in the field. And the, it talked about the courageous men on both sides of the battle. Courageous men left that fortified city and went out in the field and attacked Joab's army. You know, the Bible is full of courageous people who, who really, uh, you know, fight for what they believe in. And you see that here. So the men gained an advantage of us. They came out, uh, but then we drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate, verse 24. But the shooter shot at your servants from off the wall, and some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Verse 25. Catch this phrase. Then David said to the messenger, say this to Joab, do not let this thing be evil in your eyes. For Pete's sake, now talk about code, you know, coded message. Don't let this thing, you know, the messenger's probably la la, he doesn't know what's going on. He says, don't let th this thing that, that some of your soldiers die be evil. And, and what David's writing to Joab, don't let this arranged death of Uriah be evil in your eyes. And it just goes to show, and he says, for the sword devours one as well as the other, make your battle stronger against the city and overthrow it. So basically what, what David's saying here is, you know, let's, let's overlook this and move on. Let's not, we'll, we'll, we'll move on from this. It won't be evil to us. Verse 26, the wife of Uriah, Bathsheba, heard that her husband was dead. She mourned, uh, mourned for her husband when the time of mourning was passed, typically 30 days in the biblical custom. David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But I like this. Here's the last phrase. But the thing that David had done was evil in the eyes of Yahweh. David writes and says, hey, Joab, don't let this be evil in your eyes. God, <laughs> he is... He is not that easy to fool. He's not going to move on from murder and adultery, and it's going to come right out. Well, you may be trying to make this not evil, but it, Yahweh says it's evil in my eyes. You bet it is. Let's go to uh, first, Second Samuel chapter 12. So now Yahweh sends Nathan to David, and at this point, my gut feeling is Nathan probably had some kind of inkling of what went on. Uh, Nathan probably got a, a very uh, more or less a complete revelation about what happened because after telling this little story, he looks at David and says, you are the man. And it's in this, it's in 2 Samuel 11 is kind of the setup for some of the spiritual things that we see in chapter 12 and we'll see that. So Yahweh sent Nathan to David. Now, Nathan probably was, um, this is the kind of message you don't want to deliver. And again, one of the things when there's evil in the mix, the one of the things that it does is it shows the good from the bad. Like here's David and there's evil and Joab is complicit and willing to kill a, a, a wonderful soldier because David wants it done. And yet you have great men like Uriah that, that know what right is. They know what is right and they take a stand on it. Nathan's the same way. I'm sure Nathan didn't want to deliver this message, but he's a man of God. He answers to God and he's going to do what God says. That's you and me. That's where we want to be. That's what we pray about. You know, let me step up and do your will, God. So Yahweh sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except this one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his meager food because it was a poor man. He didn't have much. It ate of his meager food, drank from his cup, lay in his bosom, and was, to, was like a bat to him, bringing up the word bat, which is going to ring in David's ears because he had just killed the, the, the husband of Bat Sheba. was like a bat to him, a daughter. Verse 4, now a traveler came to the rich man and he refused to take from his flock and from his herd 
to prepare for the guests that had come to him, but took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And then that's as far as Nathan got. And the text says, and David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as Yahweh lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. Now, he didn't say he would die. He says he deserves to die. That's a little different. Verse 6, and this is where a little bit of the, of the real good in David begins to shine because David knows the law. And in the law, if you stole something, you restored, you know, four sheep for a sheep, five oxen for an ox. And so he knew that from the book of Exodus. He knew that from the Mosaic law. And so he's going to at least enforce the Mosaic law. And he says he must restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. He must restore the lamb fourfold. Now to Bathsheba, the lamb was her husband. I mean, you know, you know, in the story, the, the lamb is a girl, but if you're Bathsheba, the lamb that is taken from you and slaughtered is your husband. And here in verse six, there's a, a very interesting irony. There's nothing really stated about it specifically, but it, it is intriguing that David killed, killed Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, and the law said you restore fourfold. And, you know, this is about sheep. And granted, it's not about human life. And the laws for human life are totally different. So I don't understand all of the machinations behind this by any stretch of the imagination. But I know this. When David said he must restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. It's interesting that when we read the scripture, four of David's sons died in um, less than ideal circumstances. You have Bathsheba's baby who died. You have Absalom murdering Amnon. Amnon was David's first son, and he was murdered by Absalom. Then you have Absalom revolt against David, who would, and Absalom was murdered, not murdered, actually killed in a war, killed in a war by Joab. And then you had David's fourth son, Adonijah, who tried to wheedle behind the scenes to get the kingdom from Solomon and Solomon had to kill him. So David said, you know, or, you know, here David said, you've got to restore the lamb fourfold. I can't put it together precisely, but it, I think it's at least a spiritual coincidence that David killed Uriah and four of his sons died um, as, as a parent, as part of the consequences we'll read on. And then verse seven, then Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what God, Yahweh, the God of Israel says, I myself anointed you king over Israel. Now we know that Samuel actually poured the oil on David, but what we've got to see when we read the Bible with spiritual eyes is how God is working behind the scenes. God is making things happen. We pray all the time for divine appointments God sets up those accidental things. Gail, I so loved what you said today about all the people that you got to minister to. And here you are in the hospital. And, you know, in, in olden days, I might have said, well, you know, you're in the hospital, you're sick, you're not a very good witness, so why don't you be quiet? <laughs> And, and, and now, now it's like, you know, we've got it. We, we're, the fact that we're human is a witness. The fact that we're faithful is a witness. The fact that we keep our faith in difficult circumstances, when there's sickness around us, when we are sick, when there's death around us, and we keep our faith and we do our best and we be humble and we be um, passionate and we become passionate. And in those, those situations that are so human, you know, we, that, that often is our absolute best witness. You know, and, and here, uh, the, you know, David, David, God says, I myself anointed you king over Israel. It was God who was behind the scenes for that. I myself delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And by all rights, Saul and his army should have been able to track David down and kill him. And it's just miracle after miracle that it didn't happen. 
And then in verse eight, I gave you your Lord's house and your Lord's wives into your bosom. And I gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And frankly, if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more such things. Basically, I would have given you everything. And then in this statement, there's, there, there are a couple things. I gave you your Lord's house, meaning, you know, all the authority of the house and, and that kind of thing, and your Lord's wives into your bosom. And there's no evidence of that. In fact, there's no evidence of that at all. You know, Saul was a, a generation older than David. And David's and Saul's wives, he only had one wife uh, and one concubine. Saul's wife is not named in the scripture, but she's the mother of Jonathan and Malkishua and, you know, the, and uh, the other uh, Ishbael and, and that kind of thing. And that was Saul's actual wife. And then Saul had a concubine called Rizpah who had sons and her sons were, were executed. Um, there's no evidence in the scripture that David ever had any kind of relationship with either one of those women, and they would have been considerably older than him anyway. So what does it mean when God says, I gave your Lord's house and your Lord's wives into your bosom? And the answer is that it's all the things that David could have had. What God's laying out here is, look, David, come on, man, if you'd asked me for it, I'd have given it to you. You know, and, and that's so much with us. You know, there's, we get prophecies occasionally where God just says, ask me, ask me, ask me. And the book of James says, you know, you don't have because you don't ask. And sometimes we just need to pour out our soul in prayer and ask God for things and then open up the gate for God to give us things. And here God is upset with David, obviously. So, you know, I gave you your Lord's house. I gave you your Lord's wives. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. I had given you what you wanted. Verse nine, why have you shown contempt for the word of Yahweh to do what is evil in my eyes? So you might write to Joab and say, don't let it be evil in your eyes. But God says, I'm God. And I'm going to tell you what's evil and what's not. And by the way, he still does. God's still God. He still makes the rules. He's still going to be the judge on judgment day. And he's going to tell us what's good and what's evil. And he says, David, you did what's evil in my eyes. You've struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword, have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the children of Ammon. And then, then a consequence. So now the sword will not depart from your house for years to come. Uh, the Hebrew word there, olam, uh, can simply mean a long time. And we know the sword didn't depart from David's house for years and years and years. The, the sword will not depart from your house for years to come because you've shown contempt for me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. This is what Yahweh says, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. And that certainly happened. I will take your wives from before your eyes and give them to another. And he will lie with your wives in the sight of this son, which is actually exactly what happened uh, in the revolt of Absalom, when Absalom revolted against David, um, one of the things he did was he had sex with David's wives on the palace roof where everybody could see. Um, and that was, of course, to, to solidify the enmity between Absalom and David so that uh, they, they, would not have, they would not have been reconciled. So uh, verse 12, for you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. And then Nathan was through. That was the prophecy. And so here David's at another crossroads. He can be like Saul and have all the reasons why he did what he did and all the excuses, or he can do the right thing. And thankfully here, we see a shift in David. And it says, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against Yahweh. And this is the David that we know and love. This is who we want to be. We we're going to make mistakes. We're going to have problems. We're going to do things wrong occasionally. We don't need to hide. We don't need to explain. We don't need to explain away. We don't need to excuse. It's real simple. I have sinned. And we have to believe it. And we have to feel it. And we have to then get a resolution. God, I'll do better next time. Because that's all we can do. Can't change the past. But we can move forward. And this is, is so beautiful. But now, after... He says, I have sinned. 
there's a really genuinely amazing statement. I've got a number of paragraphs in my commentary on this. I'm not going to go into all the different Hebrew words. I do that into the in the commentary that that could have been used here. But look at the, the, the translation in the REV, same translation you'll find in Shokin Bible by Everett Fox. Yahweh also has transferred your sin. You will not die. And Schlegel and I looked at this and like, what? Because basically every version we found except the Shokin Bible said the Lord is, Yahweh has put away your sin. The Lord has put away your sin. The Lord has forgiven your sin. The Lord has pardoned your sin. That is not the Hebrew text. The Hebrew text uses a word for passes on, uses it in the hifal aspect, a causative, God has caused your sin to be transferred. This leaves a whole bunch of unanswered questions. I mean, there's, there's a lot of questions about how this works. We see in the scripture that it does work. Sin gets transferred. But why God, Why some sins are transferred, some sins are just forgiven? You know, I, I don't have a lot of answers for that. But here's a situation where David had committed adultery and he'd committed murder and he confessed his sin. And according to the law of Moses, yeah, he, you can confess your sin, but if you did it on purpose, you would still receive consequences. And, and Nathan gets the revelation, well, Here's what's happened in this case. Yahweh has transferred your sin. And I think this, uh, this has to do with showing us something in the life of the lesser David, King David, that's going to show up in the, in the life of the greater David, Jesus Christ. Because the only way that you and I could be forgiven for our sin is if our sin was paid for, well, what does that mean? It means that, that I deserved a consequence for my sin and the wages of sin is death, says Romans 6.23. But somehow or other in God's economy, I don't have to die. All I have to do is confess and this other guy's gotta die. And that other guy is the greater David, Jesus Christ. And so here, what is happening in the text, among other things, because like I say, there's some unanswered questions here, but one of the things that's happening in the text is the Bible is pointing us to the greater David, to Jesus Christ, because if our sin didn't transfer to him, everyone on the planet, the only perfect guy ever was Jesus Christ, you know, poor Jesus, he'd be alone in the future, it'd be just him. And thank God that God set up a system whereby our sin could be transferred. And I, the, the verbiage that's used here in the text is so clear. And yet I can see, as Bill and I discussed this, I can see why other, other versions don't do this. They don't know what to do with it. I'm not sure I know exactly what to do with it, but I know this. I know, first of all, that there are a number of instances in the scripture where someone's sin gets transferred to somebody else. So for example, in 2 Kings 24, the destruction of Judah is, is said to be in part due because of the sin of Manasseh. But there was Manasseh, then Hezekiah, then Josiah, then Jehoiakim, then Jehoiachin, then Zedekiah. And it's like, holy cripes. You know, and the sin just got kind of passed down. And then I see it in, in the law of Moses in the Ten Commandments, where God says, you know, I'm a jealous God and I visit the sin of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. So I see in the scripture glimpses of how sin gets transferred. But ultimately, the beauty of this is 2 Corinthians 5.21, where it says God made him, Jesus, who did not know sin, had never experienced sin, a, to be a sin offering on our behalf in Romans 5, which says that Jesus died in our place. So what does he say? He says, Yahweh has transferred your sin, you will not die, which would be the consequence for murder and adultery. But in one sentence, you've, you've got to see this as one sentence. 
Yahweh has transferred your sin. You will not die. However, because by this deed you have shown contempt, yes, contempt for Yahweh, the child who's born to you will die. Yes, die. So there's one sentence here and, and basically one breath. And in that one breath, he says, the Lord has transferred your sin. You're not going to die, but the child that's born to you will die. And which is, of course, exactly what happened. And like I say, hey, there's a lot of unanswered questions here. And I don't pretend to have all of the of the answers, but I can. And then verse 15, Nathan departed to his house. But what I can tell you is that based on this principle of the transfer of sin, that's how you and I have everlasting life. Because if it wasn't for that, we could not transfer the sin. God could not transfer the sin that we have to Jesus Christ, who then paid for that sin by dying. So this, is, this was a very powerful record to me as, as you see, you know, such great men like Uriah who really took a stand on what was right and great men like David who made mistakes, but at least they were honest about them. And then ordinarily decent men like Joab who was complicit in a scheme that he shouldn't have been complicit in when he should have taken a stand against David and, and other wonderful lessons and examples here in this record. So I hope you were blessed by this. I was certainly blessed studying it. <laughs> like I say, I don't have all the answers yet, but it's, a, it's an amazing record. And uh, the floor is wide open for discussion, comments, commentary, wherever we want to go.